10 Evolutionary Groups, How Humans Evolve as Understood by Alice Bailey. This video is on Group 8, The Pledged Disciple, an introduction by Dr. Lisa Love. These groups reveal how humans progress from their baser animal instincts, where they are focused mainly on surviving and procreating, to the point where they know who they are as spiritual beings and live accordingly. According to the Bailey teachings, all 10 groups exist among us. And in general, we might say groups 1 to 6 are primarily focused on becoming human, groups 7 and 8 on becoming soul, groups 9 and 10 on becoming spirit. The first six of these groups have their focus of consciousness within the emotional plane, also known as the plane of kama or desire. Their lives are full of ups and downs, feeling good when their desires are met and bad when they are not. So here we see the emotional plane and approximately where they exist. In group six, they can get all their desires met, whereas those in groups one and two get almost none of them met. As a reminder, most of humanity is in groups five, four, and three. Please watch the videos on these groups on the Soul to Spirit YouTube channel to learn more. So in general, we have groups one and two down here, three, four, and five here, and six at the top of the emotional or desire plane. Next, we go to group seven and group eight, which are both involved in becoming soul or becoming the soul-infused personality and starting the initiation or expansion of consciousness process. The two groups connected to becoming soul are group seven and eight, and group seven starts the radical shift in human development where people no longer look out there for the divine, but within themselves. They also start the process of spiritualizing their body, emotions, and minds. Finally, they may struggle with being in the world due to the focus on exploring inner realms. Group 8 has more understanding of the inner realms and is both removing distortions on how these inner realms work while gaining more mastery of them. Because Group 8 is more grounded and is working more on removing selfish tendencies, they're much more able to be in the world and not of it, helping them to serve others in a more illumined way. Whereas groups one to six are focused on the emotional plane, group seven is shifting onto the plane of the lower mind. Here they are penetrating into the realm of thought, learning how thought works and how their minds are conditioned and how their thoughts influence their own and everyone else's lives. So here we see the plane of the lower mind and group seven I have theorized, the Bailey books do not say this, but I feel it fits with what they imply, that group seven is within these three lower subplanes of the plane of the lower mind. Because they are still a ways from the plane of the solar angel, seen here in these three higher subplanes above this dotted line, the plane of the solar angel where the soul is found, their thoughts are still too often colored by selfish desires. Despite being on a spiritual quest, those in group seven have their emotions still often reactive and they can be overly attached to their beliefs, though their minds may tend to be more open, inclusive and flexible than those in groups one and six. When we move into group eight, we are residing more on the top subplanes of the plane of the lower mind and penetrating into the plane of the solar angel where the soul resides. Soul values and more easily comprehending soul and a more sincere motive exists to live as a soul without selfish personal motives getting mixed in. So here we see the plane of the lower mind moving up into the plane of the solar angel. And this is where I believe the group eight people reside based upon my extensive understanding of the Bailey teachings. At group eight, they also demonstrate a greater control of their minds, quieting their thoughts more frequently at will as they enter into the states of Samadhi, mainly Dhyana and Savitarka Samadhi. 
Watch the videos on Samadhi on the YouTube channel to learn more about these particular kinds of stages of meditation. Their perception of spiritual realms tends to be more accurate due to developing greater discernment or viveka, and service is more a keynote than simply spiritual study. Another major shift as we move into group seven and then later into group eight is there is much less emphasis on mystical experiences in group eight than simply accumulating esoteric or spiritual knowledge. Those in group seven are busy shifting the energies of the sacral center into the throat center. Therefore, their intellects are highly stimulated, while at the same time they are mixing their creative throat center energies with the sacral center's propensity for pleasure. So here we see the shift from the sacral to the throat center that is going on in group seven. In group seven, this creates an almost seductive need for spiritual experiences that open the mind and satisfy the mind's need to explore inner realms. Eventually, the more those in group seven shift their energy into the throat center, this pull for experiences and intellectual knowledge dies off, while at the same time they retain the insights gained from both experiences and an intellectual understanding. But as we move into group eight, though mystical experiences and intellectual knowledge may continue, the emphasis on both tends to die down. Now a new shift is occurring from the solar plexus center to the heart center. The solar plexus center is associated with power and creates what has often been called the solar plexus split, resulting in the tendency towards division and into who is right and who is wrong. But as the energies shift from the solar plexus center into the heart center, the need to divide and conquer, found even in many spiritual groups who tend to fight over who is superior and inferior to others in the way of their experiences or their intellectual understanding or their opinions, again, all of this dies down. Retaining the desire to be inclusive, first seen with group six aspirants, blends in with intelligent spiritual awareness seen in group seven probationary disciples into what I am calling here the sense of intelligent love. And this occurs regardless of what ray makeup you are on during this particular stage of the spiritual path. Now, those on who know the rays on the two to four six line are going to find this particular stage easier than those who are on the one, three, five, seven lines. And when we get to group nine, that's going to shift. But for right now, we could say that those on the two to four or six line are going to find it easier in terms of this solar plexus to heart center shift. Intelligent love that comes from the heart chakra goes beyond the group six aspirant and group seven probationary disciples ideals of oneness with everything and everyone. Here in group eight, the emphasis is shifting from the one to the one in the many, kind of a non-dual dualism, we could say, from trying to understand the unmanifest in other realms, which is especially emphasized in group seven probationary disciples, to attempting to discern in group eight how to both live in and intelligently be present to and understand and love all that comes into one's field of awareness. To really love requires having skillful means. Those in group eight are attempting to learn these skillful means so they can serve and love others more intelligently. Those in group eight are also becoming more practical in that they are better able to discern their dharma and deliver that dharma in a non-selfish way so that they can serve the greater good according to any unique skills they possess. Now, in previous videos, we have talked about the association of the cella names 
the six stages of discipleship involving the six cella names and associated them with the groups, especially as we've gotten into group seven probationary disciples. So let's look at some of them for group eight. As I said in previous videos, we've spoken about the six cello names that correlate with the three categories we have put into group eight. The three categories in group eight are accepting, pledged, and accepted disciples. And there is a video on each of those stages in this Soul to Spirit channel. We're on the middle stage, pledged disciple. We're told that accepted disciples are taking initiation. That would be the second initiation. Pledged disciples are being accepted and accepting disciples are taking their pledges. That comes from the book Externalization of the Hierarchy, pages 529 to 530. And again, the initiation we're talking about here is the second initiation, the second expansion of consciousness. When it comes to group eight, the cella names that seem to apply are primarily cella in the light for the group eight accepting disciple, though it also appears to have some overlap with the group eight accepted disciple name as well, perhaps because it is starting that stage once the cella in the light stage is done. Whereas the group eight pledged disciple is only associated with the cella accepted disciple name, mainly because the person is training more fully to become an accepted disciple than a group eight accepting disciple is. So let's look at the chart for a moment. We have the cella in the light, which is associated with accepting disciple, and the cella name accepted disciple, which is associated with accepting disciple. Now, the accepted disciple cella name is associated with both the accepting disciple and the pledged disciple until the pledged disciple becomes fully the accepted disciple cella name. One of the things that I've done, there is a video on this, is I've associated all the different terms that are mentioned in the Bailey books, which can tend to be very complex, into one master chart. Look for that video on the Soul to Spirit YouTube channel. So what are the main themes of the accepting disciple? We have a whole video on this, but what I'd like to do is quickly review the key points in this video. The accepting disciple was attempting to become more emotionally stable and calm, less reactive emotionally. They were engaged in karma yoga, not only every day trying to live spiritually, but trying to make amends actively for the various karmic repercussions of negative behaviors, thoughts, and deeds, and try to make those amends to others. They are involved in living a rhythmic life removing the many glamours, cleansing the critical mind, and cultivating more of what I've called the heart mind, or a loving, intelligent mind. And these are just the beginning stages when we're at this point of the accepting disciple. There's a whole video outlining these six different stages. You can go and watch that on the Soul to Spirit channel. The Pledged Disciple is living a life of service, removing complexity, engaging in soul or what the Bailey books called white magic. I'm calling it soul magic because I think that's a more modern PC term. They are involved in learning divine indifference, engaged in effective group work, cultivating courage, engaging in the right use of the will, and are involved in a higher level of devotion. And those are the main themes we're going to talk about in this video. So let's briefly go through these main themes of the Pledged Disciple, starting with the life of service. The Pledged Disciple is essentially someone who has pledged him or herself to a life of service. We're told that the pledged disciple, quote, teaches principally by what he is and by giving all of himself to all whom he meets. 
He moves outwardly spontaneously when someone comes within his range of his possibility of contact. And that's from Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 2, page 483. And please do not get hung up on the fact that there's only the male pronoun in the quotes. These books were written about 100 years ago. That's what everybody did in every book anywhere. And instead of changing the quotes, we're going to leave them as they are and practice not having our emotional reactivity while we read them. Continuing with what's written here. There is a saying that people won't remember what you say so much as how you make them feel. That is reflected in this quote as well. As we move into group eight, it is not so much about learning about spiritual or esoteric concepts or having experiences, mystical, drug-induced, or otherwise, as it is about living a life of service to others. This is a big distinction between a group seven probationary disciple and a group eight especially pledged disciple and that there is more awareness not necessarily to making people feel good we're not trying to pacify people with a phony love but we're trying to be wise in our use of words go back and watch the videos for the group seven probationary disciples the rules for that group and remember that one of the rules was learning the right use of speech there, syntax, grammar, all of it, knowing how to convey correctly what we want to say, not only so that it evokes truth and doesn't sound within the halls of Maya, create distortion or glamour or untruth. We want to not only convey truth, but especially as a group eight pledged disciple, accepting disciple, it starts there. We want to convey love. We want our words to be wise and to create connection and not division. This is a new level in the way of service for the especially pledged disciple. Accepting disciple is just starting to learn that. The pledged disciple is committed to doing that. So we help people feel connected in what we're saying even if we are disagreeing that enables the ability to be kind and loving and arrive at a point where we agree to disagree and keep respect intact even if we have to very much disagree with the other person we don't do it out of emotional reactivity or especially pride or judgmentalness now that service may involve political, philosophical, scientific, artistic, educational, religious activities or more. As an accepting disciple, remember, we began the process of karma yoga, but as a pledged disciple, we are engaged in service in a more heartfelt and sincere way. The selfish motives are being weaned out of it because more and more of the glamours are being removed. The glamours are the emotional distortions that cloud the mind where especially group seven probationary disciples we think because we know things that we are not being um, unspiritual and yet our emotional energy in it and our emotional attachment to our ideas i'm deliberately being a little dramatic here so you can get the sense of it that attachment to our point of view and our way of being and our right knowledge or our mystical experience you can hear in my tone of voice as i'm exaggerating it the glamours that are involved in that and we're trying to remove that one more point even the Bailey book said that the majority of people living a life of service are not found in esoteric groups. And we really have to become aware of that because if these 10 evolutionary groups are going to be applicable to all of humanity, they can't just apply to people found in esoteric groups. They have to be found in all people everywhere in different religious, philosophical, different beliefs, even agnostic or atheistic, may have a heart full of love and doing a life of service in a heartfelt and sincere way and being free from glamours and being pledged disciples. As the Bailey books go on to say, quote, 
the hallmark of the pledged disciple and a quality which should increasingly dominate his life is the capacity to identify himself with the part or with the whole notice the non-dual dualism in there the part the manifest the whole the unmanifest back to the quote identify himself with the part or with the whole as seems needed at any particular time such an attitude involves a comprehensive sweep of love and this leads to inclusiveness and to the pledging of the life service to the greatest number and to the most needy if i were asked to specify the outstanding fault of the majority of groups of disciples at this time i would say that it is the expression of the wrong kind of indifference leading to an almost immovable preoccupation with their personal ideas and undertakings these militate against the group integration and tend to block the work one of the things most needed by every disciple is to apply the teaching given to the idea of promoting and increasing their world service thus rendering practical and effective in their environment the knowledge that has been imparted and the stimulation to which they have been subjected there are some very key words in this quote that i have chosen about the pledged disciple first of all it has to be practical and they are looking for the area that they can serve the greatest good they're not necessarily looking for the area where they can just impart esoteric facts or be involved in special esoteric or mystical experiences again that's more the probationary disciple they're trying to serve the larger whole and they have to fit that service activity with whatever their ray makeup or their particular talents or skills are and whatever their dharma is but they want to make an impact and serve the largest amount of humanity they can with those skills also notice the words inclusiveness involved in there and we're going to learn about the right kind of indifference in just a moment they are also not preoccupied with only their personal ideas and their personal undertakings which is another important thing to understand because again those block group integration this is primarily something that the pledged disciple is overcoming that especially we see in group seven probationary disciples they have their ideas their opinions their research their knowledge their mystical experiences the leader of their groups and they don't tend to know how to bring in the solar plexus to the heart center transfer of love that helps unify people and even unify groups another thing that surprised me you're going to like this quote i think if you know the bailey teachings is this one about pledged disciples are removing complexity to render this knowledge practical and effective the pledged disciple has to learn to simplify the complexities of the lower mind remember they're starting to shift from the plane of the lower mind up into the plane of the solar angel they're right on that dotted line in the chart bailey describes it this way he and this particular text was referring to a pledged disciple begins to understand that the lower mind the plane of the lower mind with its multiplicity of differentiations and its tabulating analyzing and complicated approach to truth is only a foundation upon which he can take a firm stand but that he is faced with a profound simplicity he realizes that he must find out for himself that hint which his own ray equipment hides but also reveals which will enable him to substitute the pure reason for the many complexities of the lower mind let's finish the quote he has to wrestle with the problem of this simplicity with its penetrating potency and with its swift comprehension of the basic truth underlying the many truths he learns finally to substitute the intuition with its swiftness 
and its infallibility for the slow and laborious work of the mind with its deviousness, its illusions, its errors, its dogmatisms, and its separative thinking and culture. And that's from Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 2, pages 414 to 415. I was blown away when I read this quote because it really does help us see the difference between a Group 7 probationary disciple who is busy accumulating esoteric knowledge or wisdom or facts or philosophical concepts or all this information, scientific information, et cetera, et cetera, to the pledged disciple in Group 8 who is trying to simplify all of that and remove the complexity. We see that in the life of Jesus when he was simplifying complex truths into parables that could benefit the masses. And why is that happening? Because they're moving onto the plane of the solar angel. The solar angel resides on the buddhic plane and is attempting to infuse the soul with intuition. This is soul magic, which we'll get into a little bit in this video momentarily here. But notice that on the plane of the lower mind, especially for group seven probationary disciples and a little bit for group eight accepting disciples, the words associated with that, deviousness, errors, dogmatism, separative thinking, we have the right way. This is the literal truth. I even had somebody once tell me that the Bailey books were all correct right down to the very last period after every sentence. Talk about a dogmatism. It can be found in any organization, anywhere. It's a holdover from groups four and five tribalism that we have to let go of. And in a way, it represents a gap of development that especially group seven probationary disciples are still wrestling with. Let's go to the next slide. Soul magic. This simplicity will help the pledged disciple master soul magic, or one of the Bailey teachings is called white magic. Now, soul magic is the ability to tap into spiritual insights and turn them into thought forms that can uplift, enlighten, and influence the world for the better. To engage in soul magic, the pledged disciple needs to work on shifting from the plane of the lower mind to the plane of the solar angel. And again, the plane of the solar angel is where the solar angel who resides on the buddhic plane is inspiring the soul, the egoic, egoic lotus or causal body, to receive divine ideas. Now, Bailey's book, A Treatise on White Magic, is very much about the pledged disciple continuing to remove the problems within the mind, the problems within the emotions, even the problems within the etheric body, as well as the physical body, so that intuitions from the soul and the buddhic plane can start to come in to the pledged disciple. Now, those intuitions are going to be much more accurate when we become group nine and especially group 10 in these 10 evolutionary groups. But the group eight pledged disciple is continuing to do the work of becoming soul infused so that the bodies are purified enough that these true intuitions can start to manifest in their minds. These ideas that are filtering down from the buddhic plane into the plane of the solar angel oftentimes are aborted, which is something the book, A Treatise on White Magic, outlines. But as the pledged disciple, who is the first one who is truly learning soul magic, is learning how to keep the mind clear, that is done through the practice of samadhi. That is something that the book, A Treatise on White Magic, begins with. The need to have the soul enter into meditation deep. Watch my videos on understanding Samadhi on this channel. That book, Treatise on White Magic, was written after the book, The Light of the Soul, which is Bailey's interpretation of the Yoga Sutras of Pantanjali. So what does that mean? That means that the pledged disciple is mastering the book, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and you can use Bailey's interpretation. I've studied many in terms of her teaching the light of the soul. 
Only when you've got that down can you start soul magic. As the pledged disciple engages in soul magic, learning how to keep the mind clear, the emotions calm, and the etheric and physical bodies pure is necessary. All three of these are something the pledged disciple is applying themselves more fervently to so that their service activities can be more fruitful in the world. You are pledged to these disciplines. You're not just accepting them. Let me put it this way. The probationer disciple hears about them, it kind of goes on and off or skips steps or makes excuses or gets overly involved in experiences and thinks that's the, the thing because that's much more entertaining or being very intellectually astute, they think that's more entertaining, et cetera, et cetera. The accepting disciple realizes, well, that wasn't quite it and is starting to accept the disciplines, but the pledged disciple is pledged to doing these disciplines each and every day of their lives. One of the things that helps them get there is divine indifference. As the pledged disciple becomes more immersed in service, they learn what Bailey calls divine indifference. The Bailey teachings say, here's another quote, when will disciples learn that the attitude which involves a certain don't care reaction and form of indifference is one of the quicker ways by which to release the self from personality claims? This is not the don't care spirit which will affect the disciples' attitude to other people. It's not that, I'm breaking out of the quote for a moment, it's not that whatever kind of thing that became popular much longer after the Bailey books were written. It's not just a dismissive attitude here, going back to her quote. This is not the don't care spirit which will affect the disciples' attitude to other people. It is the attitude of the integrated thinking personality of the disciple towards the astral or emotional bodies. It leads him to assume the position that not one single thing which produces any reaction of pain or distress in the emotional body matters in the very least. These reactions are simply recognized, lived through, tolerated, and not permitted to produce any limitation. All disciples would do well to ponder what I have just said. The whole process is based on a deep-seated belief in the persistence of the immortal being within the forms of the soul and the personality. That's from Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 1, page 57. Now, those of you that know the Yogacara Sutras of Patanjali, you know that this is the essential teaching of the Yoga Sutras. Neither pleasure nor pain. You are able to remain within the soul, within the self, and be unmoved by these different emotional personality reactions. You notice them. You see them arise through the Ajna Center. You are witness to them. And then you know how to dissolve them so that they don't impact the field of love, so that the things coming through you in your speech and your emotions, etc., don't create more division. You can not agree with somebody's point of view. You cannot personally like an experience you're going through, but you remain detached in a positive way. You are not indifferent to love, even love of your body that needs some physical care. It's not like you just say, oh, who cares? Let my body just rot. That's the wrong kind of indifference that you see in some spiritual traditions. Instead, you are saying, I'm handling this in a way of always knowing who I am, first as the soul and then as the self. This divine indifference fits with the growing ability to be detached. And again, the training in Raja Yoga that comes from the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali helps a pledged disciple be less reactive or indifferent to likes and dislikes. 
as does the Bhagavad Gita that teaches the pledged disciples not to be attached to the fruits of their labors. Now, Bailey was going to do a commentary on the book, the Bhagavad Gita, but she passed away before she was able to do it. But in her writings, it's mentioned in many places that the Bhagavad Gita is in many ways another major text for the pledged disciple. So those two texts, the Bhagavad Gita, the Yoga Sutras of Pantanjali are very important as is a better understanding of the Bible. Side note, I am also a member of the Self-Realization Fellowship and have really great love for the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. And in many ways, his teachings are par excellence in the way of his modern interpretation of the Bible, which is the second coming of the Christ, his interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita, which is God Talks to Arjuna, which also that series of books, it's its two books, God Talks to Arjuna, volume one and two, has a lot to say about the Yoga Sutras in there as well. So I highly recommend to those of you that are interested getting involved in reading those books. And also if you're interested getting involved in reading the Self-Realization Fellowship lessons, there's almost a hundred of them, and they really give a lot of details which help explain the Bailey books and even Bailey techniques, which I'll talk about in later videos. Another thing that the pledged disciple has to be involved in is effective group work. This divine indifference will certainly be necessary as the pledged disciple becomes more involved in effective group work. Effective group work is not easy as the rules for group initiation found in Bailey's book, Rays and Initiations, demonstrates. Even Bailey's spiritual teacher known as the Tibetan was not able to hold his group together due to their personalities still being too predominant. Now that's because most of them were group one uh, excuse me, group seven probationary disciples, as well as group eight, accepting to some were pledged disciples. So they didn't really have this down, this effective group work down. But learning how to find a service group to work with who are more soul infused and thereby getting something done in the way of being receptive to ideas and bringing them through onto the physical plane, the process known as white magic in the Bailey teachings, I'm calling it soul magic, is something pledged disciples are intent upon doing. They're learning the rules for effective group work in the book Rays and Initiations, and they are trying to practically bring through ideas that can help illuminate and change humanity for the better. And this has to be demonstrated as pledged disciple. Pledged disciples are also said in the Bailey teachings to be having more of an impact on the world for the better through group service activity. Pledged disciples are told the following. Here's another quote. What can we as a group accomplish? What is it that we can do? You can, for one thing, begin to work as an ashram works, using the power of thought, originating pressures, directing thought currents along specific specified lines out into the world, creating thought forms which will make clear cut contact with other minds and which will bring about definite changes in the consciousness of humanity. This you do not as yet do, nor have you evidenced any desire so to work. I have waited to see if the initiating impulse would come from you without any prompting by me. I have waited in vain. I told you elsewhere that an ashram is an emanating source of hierarchical impression upon the world. Its impulsive energies and its inciting forces are directed towards the expansion of human consciousness. That's from the Dinah book, Discipleship in the New Age, book volume two, page 36. And it's again, you see how in the Bailey circles, how difficult this is, because even those that were involved in this work couldn't accomplish it. Now, there's a statement 
that there were only 400 pledged disciples in the world at the time that Alice Bailey lived between the 1920s and the 1940s is when she was writing these books and that statement was made. Now there were about 2 billion people on the planet at that time. I have no way of knowing if that statement is true or not, but the idea of it is it shows how rare it is for pledged disciples to be in the world who are demonstrating effective group work. And I won't get into naming possible people in this video, but you might want to sit down and think, don't look necessarily in esoteric circles. Who are the people who were able to mobilize a group around them, who were able to be effective in the world with changing the consciousness of humanity and creating a paradigm shift that helped move humanity forward. Look for those people. You can make up your own theories of who they are. I have a few of my own, and maybe in a later video, I'll talk about it. Cultivating courage. The increased emotional calm that pledged disciples have helps them to access thought forms from the solar angel again, who's on the buddhic plane, who is beginning to transmit these higher ideas to the pledged disciple for their group to carry out. A pledged disciple is usually a leader of a particular group. Because they are not yet initiates, though, Pledged disciples do not yet have perfect poise to receive pure thought forms, and therefore the service of the pledged disciples group that they are attempting to render may falter. Note, the ways a service activity may falter are outlined in her book, A Treatise on White Magic, and ways to prevent the sabotage of a group service activity are outlined in her book, Rays and Initiations. However, because pledged disciples have what today we would call greater emotional intelligence, that phrase didn't exist back in Bailey's time, I'm using it here, and they have an ability to love more purely no matter what the ray makeup is, due to the fact that they have been transferring energy from the solar plexus to the heart chakra. See the video on group eight, accepting disciple to learn more about that. They are more effective in their service ex activities despite the potential for failure. Now, pledged disciples, they're not perfect. And like Arjuna and the Bhagavad Gita, they must summon up the courage to do their dharma in the battle of life. And that is not easy to do. And often they end up laying their lives on the line. And they are often the subject of vehement attack by others, whether they're in the political, philosophical, educational, scientific, religious, whatever field they're in, they are moving with their group, humanity forward into being more inclusive and loving and Christ, Krishna, Krishna, Buddha, Buddhic, Buddhic plane like consciousness. That is what they are attempting to accomplish. And the pledged disciple is willing to have the courage to be a leader and move that forward despite these attacks with courage. Now, in the Bhagavad Gita, if you know the story, Arjuna is talking to Krishna. And he is faced with a great battle where he must fight not only a lot of his brothers, but some of his spiritual teachers. And what he wants to do, Arjuna at first, wants to run away from the battle of life and go into the woods and just be a spiritual seeker and meditate. That's like a group seven probationary disciple kind of thing. But this is a text for group eight pledged disciples and actually beyond. And Krishna, a word very close to the word Kristna, tells Arjuna to summon up the courage to fight. Now, courage is essentially a word that means take heart or come from the heart, come from love, come from that greater love of the human condition. 
In the Bailey teachings, the pledged disciple is likewise encouraged to enter the battle of life, not like a group seven probationary disciple who wants to escape it, but to enter it. The Bailey teachings say, quote, it takes courage to make spiritual decisions and to abide by them. It takes courage to adjust your lives daily and in all relations to the need of the hour and to the service of mankind. It takes courage to demonstrate to those around you that the present world catastrophe is of more importance to you than the petty affairs of your individual lives and your humdrum contacts. I'm going to break from the quote for a moment. Just consider how you spend your life. What kinds of activities are you involved in? Now, you may think, especially as a group seven probationary disciple, that you're involved in spiritual activities, but do they protect you from the battle of life or engage you in it? Do they keep you just preoccupied with mystical encounters or things that benefit mostly you? Or do they meet the need of the hour that must be met? Are you running from the need of the hour? because you're afraid of entering it? Can you even see that fear is what is motivating you? Or do you love humanity so much that the need of the hour is dominating your everyday life? Let's go back to the quote. It takes courage to discard the alibis, which have prevented you from participating to date in the all out effort which characterizes today the activities of the hierarchy, spiritual beings who are attempting to move humanity forward on the inner realms, and also some of them are in the outer world. It takes courage to make sacrifices, to refuse time to non-essential activities, and to deal with the physical body as if it were free from all impediments. It takes courage to ignore frailties, which may be present, the tiredness incident to a long life, the physical tendencies which handicap and limit your service, the sleeplessness which comes from world pressures or from a badly regulated life program, and the nervousness and strain which are the common lot today. It takes courage to attack life on behalf of others and to obliterate your own wishes in the emergency and need. That's Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 2, pages 42 to 43. Now, the Group 6 aspirant will go into the battle of life because they're still pretty full of arrogance <laughs> and self-centeredness, even though they feel that they are not. They're aspiring to do good work in the world, but they don't have the wisdom of how to do it well. If you really want to learn the wisdom of how to enter the battle of life well, there's a reason the Bhagavad Gita has been around for thousands of years. And I highly recommend that you read it, especially Yogananda's God Talks to Arjuna because it's an esoteric slant on it. I've read other texts that don't give you the esoteric understanding I can't recommend Yogananda's text on this enough. Courage also requires what is known as the right use of the will. To use the will in the right way requires calming the emotions and mastering the mind. That way the will is not used as what a student of Alice Bailey's, known as Roberto Sagioli, called strong will, where we use will like a weapon and in an emotional fit of upset, we bludgeon others until they submit to our wishes. The will is used primarily, in this case, to help the group achieve first of all goodwill and then the will to good. Goodwill is more of an emotional aspiration to treat others with love, tolerance, and respect. It's how we treat others. We give them goodwill. But the will to good is what takes place when others are not reciprocating with love, tolerance, and respect to us. Then what do we do? We invoke the will to good. We summon up the will to continue to do good to ourselves, our group, 
and the greater good at large, no matter how we are being treated in kind. That is not an easy task and requires much greater discipline of the mind and the emotions, yet that is exactly what the pledged disciple and their group are attempting to do in the world to change the world for the better and to evolve human consciousness. To get to the right use of the will, that will then must first be used upon oneself. Or we're not going to be able to hold up as a pledged disciple and a group when a service activity meets resistance in the outer world. The Bailey teachings state that there are mainly four things which frequently hold a group of disciples back from achievement and from satisfactory work. They are the lack of vision incident to a lack of of mental keenness. The minds aren't developed enough. Personal glamour. This involves the astral or emotional plane. The emotions get too reactive. They can't remain quiescent and stay in poise no matter what is happening. Individual problems involving a pronounced preoccupation upon the physical plane with its circumstances and difficulties in this most difficult of worlds and inertia or slow reactions to the imparted teaching and to the presented opportunity. That quote comes from Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 1, page 82. And you can see then why we must have the right use of the will to overcome these four things. These four things a pledged disciple and those in their service must remove, lest their service activity end up being ineffective or worse. In summary, as the pledged disciple is living everyday life, they are engaged in karma yoga, but at the same time, bhatki yoga becomes more relevant, but in a new way. That bhatki can now be viewed as a higher sense of devotion or a new kind of mysticism. This kind of devotion or mysticism is not based on the need to have visions or go into mystical states. Again, these may occur, but they are combined with a bhatki that is like a steady inner burning fire. This inner fire is fueled by a more constant connection to the divine and a deep sense of love and respect for all of life. This devotion or mysticism is similar to what couples experience in a long-term loving relationship or ideally spiritual groups tap into. They no longer need to keep evaluating if the other person is behaving in a loving way to feed the healthy growth of the relationship. Each person knows how to do this. That constant presence of love helps each of them expand that love into the remaining field of divine love while expanding that loving presence to embrace the world around them. In short, that inner sense of faith, love, joy, and hope is increasingly cultivated so the soul within is recognized and experienced. So we've reached the end of this video. Again, do subscribe to the Soul to Spirit YouTube channel and click the bell for alerts so that you can become alerted to or become aware of the new videos that are going to be posted on the Soul to Spirit channel. And again, here are the credits for this video. And I invite you to support this work by becoming a patron. Here's the Patreon address. Here's the website address. Again, Subscribe, like, comment, share, hit the bell for alerts, and most important, thanks for watching.